Hey, I'm Kenori, in case I haven't met you guys. Um, uh, I believe that I've turned off the waiting room. So if anybody um, comes, they should be able to just join. So I wanted to just give some people who have a, a little less exposure to machine learning in general and um, maybe deep learning a, a quick overview because I knew I know I could have used it um, at the beginning. I spent a lot of time having to just understand very basic topics. And um, we've noticed there's a bit of a trend where there are certain students that have these questions and they don't get them answered because one, they may be too shy to ask a question or two, um, they don't know what questions to ask. So um, having a little bit of context to provide you even with the words to ask the questions might be, might be helpful. Um, so you guys can see these slides, correct? Yep. Great. Let's go into present. Now this, this little bottom bar gets in the way. So if it's in the way of something that I don't realize, so just, just remind me. Um, and I'll and I'll move it. So we're going to move through the workflow of the general homework one part twos, but this is also just a general deep learning workflow. It's not like this is the only way. The if there will be some code on the slides, so all the code is not, you know, the only way of doing it is just an examples for things to talk about. Um, honestly, so last time I saw it, um, some of these the, they're snippets from Noor, and uh, some of it I I do, some of it I don't do. So um, I can let you know about the parts that I that I do and the parts that I don't. Um, one second. Great. Okay, let's move on. Um, so we're going to get into first starting to understand uh, getting the data from from Kaggle. Um, I don't use as much collab. I use more of AWS. I can tell you what I know about it. Um, if you have any particular questions about that, uh, it might be better to talk to someone else who actually uses it. One thing that I haven't done is use Collab Pro. Um, we'll understand the data for those of you who haven't seen um, speech data before. Um, it was something that was new to me as well. And then the pre-processing and loading, well, there's not much pre-processing as much as loading it up and getting it ready to iterate over. Um, and since there is a fair amount of it uh, in the training set, especially, you have to be careful if you're not using Collab Pro and you're using the normal Collab or using an AWS instance, you can fill up your RAM uh, by doing specific things and I've experimented with a few of them so I can tell you uh, what I run into. Then we'll talk about running the model and then Noor calls it hyper tuning, um, but it's just the hyperparameter tuning process and then submissions. So um, getting the data. So there's, there's a couple of ways to do get the data from Kaggle. One is to download locally using that Kaggle site. You've probably seen it at this point. Um, there is a, you know, there's a button to download. You can also do it directly through the Kaggle API. Um, I generally do the Kaggle API. Uh, it takes a long time for my, my computer and my network to download it locally and then re upload it to a, you know, a Google drive or, um, transfer it to AWS. So I just like to do it directly. And, and I know for, I know for a fact that transferring it directly from the Kaggle API to AWS is pretty fast. So one thing to mention is that if you want anything to persist on Google Drive, make sure you mount your 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 personal drive to the um, to the Google Collab instance and uh, and um, anything that you want any memory you want to persist, you need to put it on that drive because the instance itself is a temporary virtual machine that you're running on, and it will it when it turns off it all that all of it gets wiped. It's it's just it's made in a way that allows the next user to get it. Um, but there are commands here that you can review to open it up. You will need to unzip them. You can specify paths and everything for that. Um, this is just the basic commands. Now that you know what to look for, you can look these up. And um, there, if you have any uh, more questions, you can probably ask one of us, but I would suggest just looking it up yourself. It's, it's faster because if we don't know, we're looking it up too anyways. Um, this is just describing how to use the API. Um, one of the things that I will note Okay, this thing is annoying. Can I move it? I guess not. Okay, one of the things I will note is that um, usually these first couple steps are pretty easy. You just kind of pip install Kaggle. You know, you you make a JSON little file, um, and then it uses that as your credentials to get to Kaggle. But one thing is, is I think on the Google Collab in particular, you have to update the permissions on that on that file. Um, and so you have to use this command to do that via Google Cloud. 
The reason why is because some VMs don't let you use tokens or keys that um, that don't have correct permissions if you don't know much about computer security. If if you're if it's basically like saying if your password is free game for anyone to read, they don't want you to use that as a password. So they make you uh, lock it down before you can use it. Um, here's a fun little meme that <laughs> that Nor put in here. All right. Um, Cool. These are more commands used for this. Um, this is something that I didn't, I hadn't heard about and I actually personally haven't done. Um, and it's AWS file transfer. Uh, Nora was explaining it to me. It sounds like uh, what you can do and you can look this up if you, if you wanna do this yourself is you can make a local, um, you can get like a local file system that will SSH and automatically copy the things that you put in this file system over to your AWS instance. Uh, I personally don't have experience with it, but I have used other similar things in the Windows for different, for like Azure or something. So I do know those things exist. Um, that might be nice, but I tend to just use the command line and use the command SCP, which is like secure copy, I think. And I just copy things over, or bring them back. Um, the other thing is that if you do open up a Jupyter notebook in, in the right file paths in the AWS instance, that is also sort of like a file, um, you can like traverse files on that machine uh, using that. Um, on the AWS instance, it's it's these commands here. Um, these shouldn't be new. I'm gonna move pretty quickly through these because uh, um, these are things that you hopefully have seen before. Uh, and yeah, you don't need, if you don't want to, you don't need to do an SCP for um, your, your Kaggle.json. You can um, make your own file there by using the touch command. And I can put that in the chat if you want to. Um, it, lit it literally is the word, like you want to touch a file. So it's, it's touch and then file name. So I put that in the chat. It's just touch file name and in that it will make a, so like kaggle.json or something. And it will make a uh, kaggle.json. And then if uh, you can edit it in there, um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have ever used Nano. Um, you can use nano file name to open it um, and then you can edit it from there and don't worry about all the different commands that exist for using it. All you need to know is you copy paste your key and your, um, and your, your password in there, or the, like, like your key and your username. And then you just hit control plus O control plus X. Control O will write, will like write to it. It'll say I've written to this file and control F, or and that's, it saves it. So I control O like it saves it and then control X exits out. But if you're, if you want to know how to use nano, um, you can also, that's easy, quick look up. That's how I usually do it. I just copy pasted it directly. Um, did I miss anything on that slide? I think this is it. You do need to sign up for the CAG. If you haven't already done this, which I really hope you've already started and signed up for the CAG competition, you will have an error if you try to download the data without start without joining the competition and you don't provide your username and the correct key. Okay, data loading, you can use these mp.load uh, lines. You probably have seen these before. Um, what, okay, it doesn't say here, but one thing it will mention later is, is loading it and when you load it and where you put it can matter. So if I don't mention that in some, and you're curious about that, please remind me. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, I think, once we hit the data, the, the, um, the data set section. So understanding what data we're looking at. So in, in general, for those of you who are new to, to machine learning in general or, or any sort of like statistical learning, you have some value thing. It can be like a list of like letters or numbers or an object and it would map to some label that we're trying to classify it as. You can also do this where you're trying to take some, um, you know, features and map it to numbers. But right now we're doing a classification test. So we'll just stick with classification. So right now what we're doing is we're taking these spectrograms, which are like these processed um, voice recordings and we're mapping it to a sound a human makes when they speak. And so like eh would be one sound that they would make. And our goal is to like get as many of these uh, mappings correctly. And what I when I say mapping, what I mean is like you can look at this location in the speech recording, and it will and it should be able to map to the correct sound that it's making. 
it's just a general term for like, you know, you get from point A to point B. So. Um, I don't know this library. Oh yeah, so there's different kinds of data. Um, one of them is the training data, which is what your model will actually learn from. The next one is the validation data. It's much smaller. And what it's checking is that your model is um, generalizing outside of just the training data. Um, does anyone know why you would might need to check that? Make sure you don't overfit. Yeah, so making sure you don't overfit, exactly. So overfitting, for those of you who don't know, is when your data gets um, too specific to the data that, that you're training on. It's like a student who memorizes the answer to math questions rather than learning how to, how to actually do the math problems. Validation is kind of like a quiz where it says, have you memorized the data you're looking at or are you able to actually generalize to problems you've never seen before? You know, if you do these deep learning problems, I hope that you don't just memorize the problems that we do in the homework, but also you can go to any deep learning problem and apply those same task tools. So that's the, that's the idea. And then the testing data is what we're going to deal with in the submission um, for the Kaggle. It's, it's, what, it's to see how well your model performs. One thing I will say is, and I got caught on this last semester because I didn't know you couldn't do this, was you're not allowed to train on the validation data because we're trying to standardize all the data that people are allowed to train on to make it fair um, what you can train on. Your model might perform exceptionally well if you train on the validation data and it will be very easy to tell. Um, so, and you submit your code afterwards. So uh, with, with the model training, so we could actually recreate your model and see if we wanted to like how well it was supposed to do without validation data. Um, but yeah, I was really bummed when I heard that because I, for the second homework, I trained on validation and I did something weird. And then I, I got like this really high percentage. And then, and then some TA was like, we hear that some people are training on validation data. You can't do that. I got I cried to myself. I was really sad. Um, for those of you who don't know how the, the data was created, there there is somewhere, I think, linked in the write-up uh, how it's done, but they create something called a male spectrogram. I don't exactly know perfectly how that is, but what I from what I do understand is they take these frequent, uh, they take um, the direct sound amplitudes or something. They take widths, windows of it. They do what's called a Fourier transform. It takes it from a time domain to a frequency domain. Don't worry about that. Basically, it tells you the frequencies um, that are in that are in that speech, and it puts them into like you know vec a vector form of those frequencies. Um, and it does it for small windows. And then you have this process um, thing. They might they might do some sort of transformation, like a log transformation or something as well, in there to keep it all, you know, whatever they need to do. But um, yeah, so there is some processing involved. It's not just someone, you can't just like listen to these things. Um, and so uh, I love this image. I don't know where she got this, but this is, this is amazing. So this is exactly what it looks like. Um, so the, there, are, there are empty boxes here and we're gonna fill them in, but on your own, and I, we don't have a lot of, I don't want us to take too much of your time. So I'll just run through it, but usually what I would do is I could ask you like what each of these dimensions are, okay? But what this data is, is it's, it's varying lengths, what are called utterances, which is like someone saying a word, right? So that's what each of these are, is these layers here. You see these, these, um, these, these rectangles, they are a different length utterance, okay? And each one of them have variable lengths, so they're not just this clean stacked, uh, I don't know, um, even data set. So when you first load the data, you'll notice that it says, I have dimension something comma nothing, right? And the reason why is because it's a list of NumPy arrays at that point. It's a NumPy array of NumPy arrays. So it's not quite, um, at least if I remember this data set correctly, it's not quite a um, three, it, it's hard to say it's a three dimensional array at this point. It is a single dimensional array full of two dimensional arrays, which is a little weird. Um, this dimension would be the time dimension, how long that utterance is, how many time steps there are. Um, I guess it wants to go first to this one. So this is, this is how many utterances there are. This is the first dimension. The second dimension is how long the, the utterances are. And that is the time, the, the time dimension. It doesn't take you the same amount of time to say hello as it does world, for example. Hello world might have two different lengths for two different words, so um, yeah. And then remember when I said that they created a, 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 um, a frequency domain vector, that's this 40 dimensional vector here. 
So if you were curious, why is each time step 40 dimensions is just a single sound, you know, whatever. It's because they took the sound and they broke it down into the parts. If you think about an orchestra, you can break it down into many parts into the individual, you know, instruments. So when your voice, when you speak, you actually are gone many frequencies when you're speaking. And so um, that's sort of like what's going on here. That's an easy way of saying it. Technically, you could probably break down each instrument as well, but don't worry about it um, if that's new to you. If I'm going too fast, also just let me know in chat or something, or you know, unmute and just let me know, like slow down, or you can put questions in chat or something. Um, I think she, when she first made these slides, she had planned it to be sort of interactive. So these are actual questions that she would ask you. Um, these are things that you can find out pretty quickly by looking at the dimensions of the data um, and you can verify. So don't worry, we're not gonna go through these now. Um, I'm sure you're very busy today. Um, man, she was really thorough. Nor, if you're watching this later, this is these are awesome slides. I forgot how good these were. I saw them once before, but um. Oh my! How many labels? One over one million. Um, how are they organized? So this is this is an interesting question. So do you guys un does you can put in chat if you don't like speaking? You can raise your hand if you like to use the participants tab. I'm I'm watching everything here. Um, do you guys understand the idea of mapping the, the um, data to its label? Do I need to go in depth on that? Okay, I'll, I'll do the, okay. It seems like people understand. So I'll just do the quick version. Basically, you can make a list that says, you know, this, this X value maps to this Y value, that thing. So um, yeah, okay. I know when, if you're too um, shy to say you don't know, you can always just private message me and I will not say who you are. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about, that's what I thought. We're gonna revisit the mapping later in this slides deck. Um, so the, the task is you have these 40 dimensional vectors and each one of them needs to be pointing at one of the um, 71 possible phonemes. So let's talk about loading this data. So you're gonna create what's called a data set for each of the, the data sets. So like there's a training set and then there's a dev set. Um, and they're the then you're gonna instantiate what's called a data loader. And that is a pre-built PyTorch class. Um, the We have to create this data set just so that we can pass it the correct uh, um, custom sizes for, you know, We'll talk about context in a second, but the, you're not always necessarily, while you're tuning, going to be passing the same amount of data to, to, the, to, the, to the model. So you might be tuning how much data you pass to it at a time. And that's, that's something that we can customize via the data set. And then the train loader has its own customization tools. Um, one thing that to point out is you really should, on the train loader, um, have shuffle on at true. Okay, and for dev set, you, you can put it at false as long as the Y values are shuffled just like the X values, it doesn't matter. Um, you can have this on true or false, I believe. Uh, the, the reason why you want it on true for sure on training is, is you, it will be covered in lecture later, but you, need, you don't want a model to see the same data in the same order every single time. The training will not go as well. It won't be as performant, it won't perform as well, and um, it won't converge as fast. I believe, all the others, you probably should have been covered in recitation, like batch size um, and things like that. Batch size, for those of you that don't know, that that's the amount of, um, you know, when you first, when you train a model, you're gonna pass it, you know, one piece of data at a time sometimes, but you can actually speed things up by passing it many pieces of data at a time. Um, and so you would stack each training instance, um, each training little data chunk um, on top of each other. And so this is saying the batch size is 512 if there is CUDA, which is if you have a GPU accessible. Um, and that's because the GPU can do that operation very fast and it can take a, it can take a bigger chunk because the, the GPU is a dedicated processor for doing parallel matrix operations. So that means there's 512 training instances going in at once. The num workers is 
is to take advantage of the parallel processes and how many workers you have. Um, for debugging, I guess, Nurs is suggesting that you can keep it at zero. I kept it at, I think, zero or one for debugging. And then when I was, but um, as long as you have access to like the GPUs and you're on AWS or something or Google Cloud, um, it should be fine. This is for the My Dataset class. This is the train loader args. And shuffle should be true for training. We got way ahead of here. Um, this, what this is illustrating here on the seesaw is one of the issues that could happen if you don't have shuffle um, shuffling on is that it, when, when you do a back propagation, the, the, the network is like basically a really flexible function, right? And you're trying to update it. If you update it always in the same order in the same way, what you can ha have is part of it will go like, you know, update to be higher and that brings the other side lower. And then the next step will ask that lower part to go up again and that higher part to go down again. And what you'll get is this seesaw where it's like the, it, it's the, the gradient descent starts to oscillate the function rather than actually having it fit the, the, the what you're trying to, trying to fit. And so it'll like bounce back and forth. So rather than actually learning anything, it's just sitting there playing, you know, pinball, but back and forth with itself and it won't converge. Um, I already told you the answer to this. Does it matter for validation? Um, it can not really, no, as long as it, as long as you don't do it for the test. The reason why you don't do it for the test set is because you're submitting it to Kaggle and the CSV that you submit needs to be in order of our order. So if you train a model and it was performing well in your machine and you submit it to Kaggle and Kaggle says you have a terrible, terrible score, you can probably guess what the issue was. The issue was, you know, um, the issue might be that your your train load, your your test loader has shuffling on. So you're not, you're just putting random uh, random labels onto the test set. So here's the my data set. Um, these you can. So this is where I was going to get into what happens um so the so in the in it you want to do the bulk of the processing for all all of the um getting it ready to iterate over in the in it so if you're going to make a mapping to iterate over you should do it in the init you should not create that in the get item probably um that's something that should be pretty clear why but if if, if um if you're still not sure why the reason why is because the get item is called every time you need another index. So this thing is repetitively called with random numbers here from the train loader. And um, and in the bounds of the ind indices that it will ask for is given by this length, which is why you have to define the length. Um, and the get item is called over and over, which means that any processing done in get item will be done once for every single data instance, which we saw was something like over a million, 500,000 or something. And so even if it takes, you know, really short amount of time multiplied by a million five hundred thousand that can become a fair amount of time. Yeah, how many times will this function be called? A lot. So you want to do the heavy processing up top. One thing that uh, I, I wonder if she mentioned it. Okay, good. So she did mention it here. So one thing that I noticed was for some students when people do, you. You see this self dot x equals x. This is assuming that you've passed it the training set, right? Or the data set that you're passing it, which means that you have outside of here train data, you know, train uh, train x or train data set or some variable that is that has the original data set which you use the n the numpy dot load line from. The issue with that is that Python will then store your data set in a memory location that's pointed to by that variable. Then you will pass that variable to this class. It, the self.x, depending on how you do this and what processing you do in here, like padding and concatenating, it, it is possible that it will reallocate the entire array again. Um, and, and for those of you who might be new to that terminology, what I mean is, is that it might, take your, your training set 
and it might put it in the same, it might take the same one and double it by making two copies because you stored it with two different variables, depending on how you do it. Now, NumPy arrays are usually pretty smart because they reference things by memory address. Um, so they say, I point to this location rather than saying I point to this memory. Um, but it, it, if you do something, for example, I noticed that when you pad, I think it reallocates, which means that the old memory address is no longer the one that you care about, um, but it's still stored in whatever intermediate variable you gave it. So as long as there is, an, is something that is pointing to that memory location, the garbage collector, which is the memory clearance system of Python, will not clear it out. And you'll end up with huge amounts of like just you know doubles or triples of the same data set depending on how you did it usually when you leave what's you know like your local scope which is like after you instantiate the class you're no longer working within your def in it um so nothing should exist except for the things that you've defined as self dot um that that saves it to that object but um there are some ways that if you you know load the data on the outside that it won't uh it might not get rid of it because that's no longer local scope. I've also noticed some weird interactions where even if I delete them explicitly, sometimes it holds on to some of the memory. So I just, what I do instead is I, this X and Y, I pass in the path, the file path instead, and I make these num, the np.load lines, the self.x equals np.load x path, self.y equals np.load y path. And that's 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 prevented me from making um, silly errors as processing might require you know more things to pay attention to. Um, we need to make sure we return the correct vector. Yes. So you need to make sure that you're returning the correct um, information here. I always, when debugging my data set, will one run it on the validate, use the validation first because the validation is much smaller. So anything that I do that like say iterates over the entire thing will take, you know, 10 seconds or a couple of seconds. Um, uh, if you do it on the train set and you have a bug and there's like some big loop in there or an infinite loop, you won't find out for a long time and you'll be sitting there waiting. But you'll know that the dev set should finish pretty quick. So I tend to use the validation set also known as the dev set to do my debugging for my data set. Um, you don't need to make anything into a tensor up in the init. You can just call it in, you can just make it into a tensor down below, by the way. Um, I tend to make, I tend to make the uh, things into a tensor either in my get item or later you'll learn what a collate function is. Um, I don't know if you guys have done that in any recitations yet, but um, you might want to do it there as well. Um, all right, and making sure, you might want to make sure that your typing is correct as well. You. Uh, just a little note for the model, you can change the data type for the model. So if you're having an error when you pass in your data into the model and it says expected a float, it might be that either um, like one of them, either the model or the data, it was expecting it to be a different type. So you should just double check your data types there. So this is just talking about it in uh, how to map the index. So um, these are different frames within a single utterance. Um, and you can map each utterance to a um, to a data index, a total data index. So, you know, most people would say, well, you know, we want to go in the first one, one through ten, if it's like ten, right? But the next one of the next utterance isn't going to be one again, because we want it to be the next thing that our model is going to train on. It's not. We're not looping over everything in two for loops. We're trying to loop over one large data set. So it really, we want it to be um, frame 11. Does anyone have questions on that? Um, I'm hoping you guys are beyond the data set, but if, if someone isn't you, you um, and you have a question on that, that's a huge deal because that will make that will make much sense. I don't see any questions. So I'm going to keep moving. If I see one, I will, I will stop. All right. So it's going to be frame 11, like I said. So oh, there are a couple of ways of doing this mapping. Um, I don't know. I think later they, that there's a discussion of how those mappings work, um, but we can, we can talk about it here and now. Um, one of the ways that people will do it is they'll say, they'll literally make a list of indices in the original data set. 
One thing you might notice if you're not using Google Collab Pro and say you're just using Google the normal Collab, um, your memory, your RAM might be smaller or AWS instances are smaller. If you're not really efficient with your memory, what can happen is your mapping is actually big enough that it takes up some, some of the room in the RAM. And as a result, you might not be able to train super effectively with a larger batch size. So um, you wanna be careful with how you do that mapping and what kind of mapping you do. There's another way which you can do, which is a general search. Um, there are many types of searches you can do on this, not just algorithmically, but how you think about that search. Like you can even, well, anyways, um, there, there's, there's details on that, but, but just keep in mind that searching is, is going to take a lot of time because if you, you're probably searching in the get item and that will take uh, much more time training. The only thing I've noticed is that searching is almost always the, um, it, it's, it's always seen, has seemed to be the lowest memory usage strategy, although it's, it's, it is slower. Um, I did create a faster searching version, but it was still like 20% or 30% slower than just, um, than, than like a normal mapping or, um, you know, iterating over everything. So I think they'll talk about one of the tricks that you can do um, later. So I'm not going to mention it now. Uh, we'll get into context. So the, the write-up talks about how there is a relationship between the previous sounds um, that you're in the next sounds um, and the current sound. And you can kind of think about this in the way that when you hear someone speaking a word, you can imagine that, oh, I didn't quite hear the middle word that they said, but I heard the word before and after, and I can kind of get from the context what word they said in the middle. So sometimes, you know, if the sound gets jumbled, you can, it really helps to know the word before and after. And that is the idea of a context. So we, go, we want to use time steps of frames before and after to help us out. Now, another TA, Eason, he had a really good uh, a really good analogy, and uh, I I really we but Nor liked it. And I liked it. all the all the TA thought it was hilarious. So the hint is adding context is just like adding some spice to your noodles. It adds some flavor and makes your noodles more delicious, but doesn't change how many noodles you are gonna eat today. Um, what what that is is he's saying that all because you have context on either side of that frame uh, that specific time step, it doesn't change the number of time steps you're using. So you're going to have what's called a moving window. The window is this red box here. You can imagine that frame I is the current index of the time step we're actually dealing with. And then plus and minus K frames the, um, is what you're going to also add to that. So the number of frames that you're actually using ends up being two times the context, right? Because it's before and after um, plus one, which is your current one. So this is something that you just want to keep in mind. And each one of these frames, don't forget, is a four-dimensional or forty-dimensional uh, vector. And it's forty uh, is a shape of one by forty. And so, as you can see, when you iterate to the next one, you're going to go to frame i plus one, frame i plus two. Now, one of the things to keep in mind here is one of the ways people will process their data that they've tried and they inevitably fail is they like to make these windows pre-made using the utterances in the init of their data set. So rather than finding this window in the get item, they will try to make a massive list of context time steps, which is a 40, so it's however many time steps, 2K plus one time steps by 40 matrix times and then one of those for every single time step in the data set. That will be so big, I don't know if you can actually initialize that in your, uh, depending on your context size, I don't think you can initialize that um, to begin with. So I think you'll just crash your, your, your instance. Um, so that's not the best way to go about it. Um, you might wanna make the padding and all that stuff later. So one of the other things um, is what happens when you hit the end, end of an utterance. Uh, you don't know how long one utterance is, and um, or you could find out, but you're not going to sit there and count, right? So you don't know. Um, and, and, and so also, when you hit the end or you're at the beginning of an utterance, you need to do something with that. So what we usually do is we pad it with the number of zeros 
that are required to fill out the rest of the frame. But one thing that this doesn't show in the graphic is that there is a there is some frame i that is before the end, but is small, but is not is, is closer close enough to be less than k steps away from the end, which is less than the context, right? Such that this window overhangs the edge. It will stick out like by one or two frames. So you need to make sure you have a case for that. Um, if you're if you don't do what we're going to talk about in a second. Yeah, you can pad with zeros because zeros are silent anyway. Um, also, the edges of these audio clips are mostly silent anyway because nobody does, no, we don't have recordings of someone saying hello and then immediately cut. It's like hello, silence, cut. So they're not tightly cropped. So what some people will do, and this is the sneaky trick, is they will concatenate all of the utterances together and take advantage of the fact this is a huge hint. Take advantage of the fact that there are silences on the ends anyways. And they will just put them all in one long row. They can store that same data set array as just the same form, but concatenate it and just pad either end. And then you can iterate over it just as one long time, one long time step utterance. Uh, the reason why you can get away with this is because the ends are, well, one, uh, the ends are sparse in comparison to the entire data set, which means there aren't as many ends as there are the actual meat of the data set, what actually matters. And that means that the error that you will get, because you will probably almost definitely get a performance decrease with this, it won't be that much because it will be over the entire data set. And there, there, you know, there's something like thousands of time steps before you even get an end. So um, for some of them, so, you know, it's not, it's not that big of a, a big of a deal also because another leveraging the fact that the ends are not tightly cropped. So there is silence at the ends anyways. So we already talked about context, the left and right side. Um, and so now we're going to get to what you're supposed to do um, with the data set. Whenever you get the item, you have to retrieve, uh, you have to retrieve the correct frame with the correct utterance with the correct label and its context around that frame. Okay, now we're gonna get into running your model. Any questions, please put it in the chat or unmute and say something before I move on. Three, two, one, great. So this is a simple MLP model. Um, this, is, this is one of the ways of doing it. Uh, you just create a class, you need to import an n.module. What that does is it, it, allow, it enables this forward function and some of the other functionality of a model. To, to be inherited by the parent class. Um, we don't need to talk too much about object-oriented programming, about what that means, but basically it will have the functionality that PyTorch wants for it to work, is all you need to know. Um, this, is, this, this way of doing it creates a list of layers that append those layers to that list and then creates a sequential object later. Um, and you can pass in, uh, what do you call it? Um, variables into the init so that, or parameters so that it changes, you know, what the sizes are and stuff like that. Um, this is just one of the styles. And um, oh, one, one key thing that, that she's mentioning here that I don't want to skip over is that the input for linear layers is a single flat vector. So um, uh, the, except for the batch sizes. So like if for a single input, it should be a single flat vector. So you flatten the input when you put it in. Batches are the stacked uh, flattened inputs where it's a one dimensional vector. So it will be 2D when it goes in, but the, the, the operations are done um, on each individual instance. So, so it's kind of like it's seeing one instance at a time, but the GPU parallelizes that whole process. So uh, don't worry about that. Um, how should this size be? Oh, what she's saying here is like how how do you choose your 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 model sizes? Well, the I believe the B cutoff or whatever cutoff um, architecture is already up, so you can kind of look at that. But one thing you don't really do is like make a big layer, then a small layer, then a big layer, then a small layer over and over. You tend to like do something like you make it bigger and bigger, and bigger, then smaller and smaller and smaller until you output or something like that. But you or you'll make it you know sometimes you'll get it big 
small and then big uh, sometime later, but it it's not really like you need to oscillate it back and forth, especially for homework one. We'll talk about what happens if you need to encode something where you need to make it into a smaller dimensional vector. Don't worry about that right now. In general, you, you, you might want a shape that's more like small at the top, bigger in the middle, smaller at the end. Um, and there's math reasons why. Uh, I might not be the best math expert to explain this, but I believe it has to do with um, keeping track of the interactions of the features and also not wanting to bottleneck the information. Because obviously if you have one neuron in the middle somewhere, no more information can get beyond it than what that one neuron can pass on. So um, and I believe that was covered in lecture um, before this. Um, the final layer size needs to be, I hope you, you know what the size is. It needs to be the size of the um, number of outputs. And the reason why is because you're actually outputting like a distribution of how confident the, the model is that, it, that this frame is this particular sound. So if there's 71 different kinds of sounds, the model is saying, I think this one has a 10% chance, this one has a 5% chance, this one has a 90% chance, you know, and then blah, 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 all the way down the line. And the 90% chance one might be the highest one. So then we say, oh, that's the one. So it's actually outputting what we call a probability distribution or confidence or something like that. And that's why some people um, will very often soft max the final vector um, on the output. Technically, you can probably let the linear layer try to do learn that softmax on its own or you know figure out like just use the absolute um sizes of the output as the comparison but uh it is i think it's generally good form to use that softmax for this guy but um i don't remember if i did or not we'll reduce the probability of the input yes i already mentioned the distribution um, one thing to mention here is what an NN sequential object is, and you can look up the docs for this from PyTorch, but this is just a object in a, um, that has its own forward. So you don't have to create like uh, you in homework one part one at the end, you will, you make a forward okay. function that iterates through the entire layers. Well, sequential kind of does that iteration for you. It does the forward um, all for you in a row. <laughs> and Noor has another funny meme here where the output of your network layer passes through an activation before going to the next layer. One thing I wanted to mention, so I asked her to add this, was, well, for linear layer, like for, for this first homework, it's not as uh, complex, but for the later homeworks, you're going to be dealing with more complicated layers that have interactions uh, with various shapes. And sometimes you're gonna mix layers that don't use the same shape uh, convention. And so what will happen is um, you can get errors or worse, you won't get errors and you will pass the wrong shape to, um, to a layer and it won't give you an error because it knows how to do the matrix operation on that output that you pass it. Um, and so what's, e what's, what's probably the worst part is your is that it won't give you an error and your model will start to learn using that weird error, that weird bug. And it will learn just enough that you think it's working and not, and, 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 and not, and not bad enough that you're thinking, oh, there's a bug. And so you'll be sitting there wondering why your model seems to plateau at this terrible performance, but it's, but it's still good. It's just like not, it's not anywhere near a cutoff that you're trying to get. And so what I, what I suggest is instead of making this uh, this sequential object when you're debugging it, um, you should manually loop through or manually pass the inputs and outputs through each layer and and check the shapes in between intermediate layers to make sure everything is on is, is okay. So I would build up iteratively my model making sure, okay, is this shape correct? And then you can even put a test case in the cell below in your Jupyter notebook where you pass in a random tensor that is the shape of the output you're going to try, or the shape of the data you're trying to pass it. And you try to see if it even makes it through the model and what its shapes are at every intermediate step. That takes another, what, 10, 15 minutes of your time to just double check with many, even many layers. 
but it will save you many hours because you might, if you don't find that, um, it will, it will come back and bite you and it's really, really, really bad. So yeah, you might want to manually loop is all that's saying. Sorry, you might want to manually loop uh, is, is the main key there. Just the real, also the other takeaway from this is not just manually looping for debugging, but also making test cases where you try to check the expected output. Like it should come out with this shape, does it? Because it would be a problem if you found out your model was running on something wrong. And I can give you an example. One thing is that I found out when I was testing this homework because I had reused some part of another model I'd used um, from, for something else that I found out that my output size was the wrong size and it was still running with no error. It was doing just fine. And uh, I don't know why it doesn't error there, but I guess it's because the math still can, it, it still exists. And so you won't know why you're just not doing well. Um, this is a simple uh, instantiation of the object. And then if you print it, you can see your layers here. Instantiate your criteria and your optimizer. Um, one more thing that I don't know if nor put in here was you might want to know what a scheduler is. So if you don't know what a scheduler is, please look it up. Um, it is it is a way of changing the it's another little added um, customization to your optimizer that will help you maybe like speed up or slow down your your steps um, or not speed up. Sorry, make your steps larger or smaller, various other things like that. And they have PyTorch has a bunch of different schedulers that you can experiment with. I have not experimented with enough of them. I know that for a fact. Um, so the criterion is is what we're going to be fitting to. That's this is the definition of the divergence, you know, difference, cost function, loss, whatever. You, um, those, all those words do not they're not identical in meaning. But I'm just when people talk about these things, they're referring to the criterion that you're going to instantiate here, and your model is fitting to this. This is a basic training loop. Um, nothing here is new. Should be new. Uh, I think this might be from based off of homework one part one. So it's not like it's a new thing to you, um, hopefully. Um, but things things to keep in mind in here, um, you run this once for every epic and every epic has many um, iterations over that are comprised of batches of data. Um, I, I've had students ask me what this is. So if anyone's watching this that, that um, doesn't know what those terms mean, Basically, one epic is this entire thing happening. One batch is one iteration of this going through, and it's, it's, it's usually referring to the data um, that is passing through. Things to keep in mind, I believe she highlights. Yes, good. So model train. Um, you need to specify model.train before you start training. I believe it defaults to train, but I always put it at the beginning of my training loop. And the reason why is because this is what's required for the model to actually learn. It sets. Uh, it sets some background, um, uh, what is it called? Background variables that will say I'm learning now and the model will actually begin to, to learn or else it won't uh, learn if you've set it to eval, for example, which we'll talk about later. Um, this is the training loop. And uh, I, I actually really like also the thing above there, which is the start time and end time because it tells me how long it is. And I like to keep track of that stuff. This is really important. Um, optimizer dot zero grad. Uh, you, what you're doing is you're taking the gradients of all of the um, the parameters and you're setting them to zero, because in between batches you, you don't want to pass on the gradient from the previous batch to the next one. Although there is an argument. Ooh. See, see, if I say this next part, what's going to happen is people are going to start. I'm, I'm worried that someone who's new is going to start taking this. Uh, to be necessary. So let me let me just provide the, the disclaimer. This is not a necessary thing. Do not do this if you're new to this, okay? But there is something you can do where you pass multiple batches through without doing optimizer.zero grad and you do a loss dot backwards and it's supposed to simulate having a larger batch size, although that can cause a problem with things like, I think batch norm can have a problem. I'm not sure. So if you're new to this, forget I said that. Don't, don't try that. Just do zero grad every time um, and, and that's, that's to zero out the gradients so that your model learns from this current batch rather than all the previous batches. Cause if you don't do that, it'll have one humongous gradient for every single time and it will continuously increase. 
Um, oh yeah, also something else to keep in mind here. You're putting the, you're putting the data on the GPU if you put it to device and usually device is some um, device object that's specified by PyTorch and you should be able to find those code snippets from recitation. Um, here's where you're calculating the loss and you do, uh, people like to keep track of the running loss. I didn't for the first homework last semester, but it is nice to know that your loss is decreasing over the epics and how it's going. If it's not decreasing, it's a quick sign that your model is not learning. And so it's very nice to keep track of because really quickly you can say, oh, I have a bug. Um, yes, I think I've said this, it produces an output. You check, the, you have the criterion and keep track of loss over all the batches. The loss dot backward is the learning, or no, it is the setting up to learn step. It's like, I don't know, it's the answers to what your current problems are. Loss dot backward is the back propagation step that will pass all the gradients back through. Um, if you want to know how that works, I talked about it in the, I think Siles, or Sai and I talked about it in the uh, recitation from last week on taking a derivative. Also, you should try the autograd. Uh, there's going to be a bonus where we actually, you can implement that yourself and use it for the homeworks. If it might make your life easier, hint. Um, so when that bonus is released, we'll let you know, please at least look at the write up because I helped build it and I'm trying to set, trying to pitch it to everyone I can, I can talk to. It's a shameless plug. Optimizer.step is when you, uh, is when you actually, um, your model learns, that's when you update the weights. So this, I believe she blocked it out. Uh, I don't know why, why we want to play with accuracy now. Um, I believe she's calculating the accuracy on the fly with every iteration because she wants to calculate training accuracy. I personally sometimes will be lazy and not tr calculate my training accuracy. I will only do it for the validation because um, it's probably bad uh, bad form. So maybe don't do that. Maybe track your training accuracy. But uh, I didn't do it. And my reasoning was that I didn't want extra computation to slow down my training when all I cared about was the validation accuracy. There's almost definitely a reason why she's tracking it. Um, so maybe follow her wise example. <laughs> Just being honest with you, I'm, I'm going to be completely straightforward and honest with you. Um, I like to have intermediate prints here as well. Uh, after every epic, you can have a print here. I also actually put a model save line in this area. So I actually created a, for me personally, I created a function that saves everything. And I call it here, passing it the model, the, the epic number, all that stuff. And um, I think she, she does it in another location, but I put it here personally. Um, and it calls this function that saves everything. And you can do save state for um, like your optimizer, your schedule or everything. So you can actually almost make this, this whole system, like this workflow reload and run it again. Reason why that's important is because Google Lab sometimes will kick you off your machine or AWS, you'll have a connection issue like your internet gave out for a half second and then you lost your SSH connection um, and you don't want your training to get killed. So, um, or you, if you're training, sorry, you, if your training does get killed, you don't want to lose the model and have to retrain it all over again for hours. So it's best, it's good practice to save every, some intermediate version of that model and have it. What I suggest is someone said, well, how do I track the model name? Do I just overwrite it every time? I said, well, why don't you just name it the model number version and the epic number? That's what I did. And in, so I always have a file, a file path a directory that's, that is just that model name. And it, and it worked, it worked just fine for me. Um, and that way I could track all my models. That also, if you get a really good one that, that performs really well, you can just hold on to it for a bit, try to get one that performs better. It doesn't perform better. Then you can go back to that old one. It will though, if you do that, like every iteration of your, of your training, like within this loop, it will get so big that uh, you're in memory that it will just fill up your, your VM. So don't do that. Just, just do it like after every Epic or something. There was something else I wanted to mention. I forgot it. Oh, I think it was just that like, you can put a print in here that says what um, iteration it's at just to keep track of how fast it's going or whatever. But if you do that um, and you don't put the, 
if you don't put this at the end, if you don't do this, print something like, or print, I believe that slash is in the correct direction, but uh, what, what I'm saying is print I, that's the iteration number, or like you can say batch index, like she, like she said here in this for loop. But if you don't put this end equals slash R, you'll have a bunch of prints all out in a row and it'll like become this huge long output. I hate that. It like bothers me so much. So what I do is I put this end slash R. I think that direction of the end or the direction of the slash is correct. But um, yeah, in chat, I, I put it, you can put end equals slash R and what it'll do is it replace that number. So it looks like it's just counting in place. It's super fun. I used to just stare at it for a long time when I first got these models working because I was so excited. Yeah, a little embarrassing, but I did. So this is just going back over, um, you kind of doing the same thing with the, uh, the validation data. Wait, this is the training loop. Oh yeah, we need to make some changes to the training loop. Um, so here's, here's, we have to make some changes in order to do the validation loops. So the, so the validation loop is not identical to the training loop. One of the major keys is model.eval. Um, one more thing that I believe is not, Okay, yeah, no, was not mentioned there. There are two things that, that, that actually should have should be highlighted. The first one is you see the with torch.nograd. That's super important. So model.eval is saying, I'm not going to learn anything because I'm just validating to see if I can do this well. With torch.nograd also ensures that none of the operations below within that with uh, sub process, I guess, I don't know what to call this, but Within that width, nothing will keep track of what's called a computational graph. Um, and that means that you're not setting up to do backprop and no gradients are being stored, which is just more efficient. It's faster, it takes up less memory. Not that you really care about um, memory usage in the validation set because it should be pretty quick, but um, it just takes up less everything. Uh, so you don't want to have to store those gradients and you're not backpropping, so you don't need them anyways. Um, so yeah, but the rest is all the same. Pretty much everything is the same. You do do the running loss often with the validation because it is convenient to keep track of and we'll talk about why later. Um, training and validation for this. Oh yeah, so this is just calling those, the, the, training, the training function and the validation and all that stuff. Um, and then what she has an example of here is also, uh, taking the information that you get, like the train loss and the train accuracy, and you can make these, um, you can make these uh, lists of those information for plotting later to keep track of. Um, and you can, you can make graphical examples and it's actually really cool. Uh, and so these are the graphical examples. The top row is the training, the, the, and this, uh, Sorry, the, the left side is the training. The right side is the validation. I know it says test there, but it's actually the validation. Test, you can't make this because you won't know your accuracy until you submit it to Kaggle. So it's not really like you can do this programmatically um, in any usable, worth it form. But um, the bottom is the accuracy and then the top is the loss. So, you know, you can imagine what it should look like. Well, you would hope that your loss for training is decreasing. And you're, and you're hoping that your validation loss is also decreasing. But one thing to note here, just as a, um, for, for people who don't, uh, haven't done a lot of training of models, you'll notice that the training loss continues to decrease, but the, the validation loss starts to go back up again. And that's actually the term that we were mentioning before, which is the overfitting where it's no longer generalizing well, and it had max performance at epic four, which is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So, so it's actually the fifth epic, but you know, it iterates from zero. But the point is, is that this, this epic is actually the best model version, um, at least in terms of generalization. The, because the model is always doing gradient descent, it will continuously try to fit the training loss or the training data and its loss will continue to decrease. So the accuracy we would hope uh, on, on the training accuracy when it's learning will, come on, go up. And you'll notice also it's not flattening out. It will continue to try to go up and up and up. Now, um, like, like the training loss, as it goes down, the training accuracy will go up, but it's not necessarily the case for the validation. As you can see, it starts to go down right here. Um, here it's saying that the best model is actually the, what do you call it? 
epic six. Um, I guess that what, I, what, what this is showing is that the loss is not direct one to one with uh, in terms of like the optimal loss is not necessarily the optimal performance in your metric. So all these different metrics of saying how close you are to, to performing well, um, it different metrics will provide different optimal points. But since accuracy is what we care about for the task in Kaggle, I'd suggest maximizing your accuracy on the validation. Um, if your graphs look like up and down spikes, like a porcupine or something, I don't know, something like up and down, something's wrong. That's what she's saying. <laughs> Another meme. That's pretty funny. Overfitting. All right, she has some tips for getting started. Uh, like, yeah, so she said start with a small portion of the data set. I, I start with the validation set um, because it is a small portion of some data. Uh, and I don't train with it. I just, uh, I just try to get it like, you know, my data set looks good and it, it outputs the right size of the shapes of data with respect to the context and stuff like that. Um, and my model can run and the, the loss is decreasing. Once I know that, I stop using the validation and I reload the model and I just run a new one with the trains uh, data. But you can also just make a subset of like the first 200. Um, and you might want to manually check a few examples. One thing that can happen is if you have a bug with padding and your data and stuff, you might notice that, oh, funny, I was accidentally only passing one time step and my entire context was all zero padding. You know, something weird like that might happen because you, you, you made a little mistake. So I would suggest to check those. And personally, I all I do this. Uh, I always check the first and the last in the data set um, because and the data loader. I'll actually iterate through it on a, on the validation set because it doesn't take that long. And I will look at the first and the last outputs of it to make sure I don't have an off by one error because I have had those. And it and it and it, the worst the worst thing in the world not the worst maybe the worst thing in the world but one of the worst is you make this big model and you start to run it. And then the last one has a shape error because your your data set has a bug and you do an entire training cycle that takes like, you know, 10, 20 minutes, maybe 30, 40 minutes. And you and you just look at it and it's failed and you'd walked away from your computer for an hour. So you have this, you know, instance running. If it's AWS, you're being charged for it. You wasted a bunch of time on this compute and you, you, you don't you also might not know where the bug is because it's going to say something like expected, you know, matrix of this size, expected tensor of this size. And you're like, well, where, you know? So it's kind of, a, that's kind of a bummer to have happen. Um, yeah, this is a good suggestion. Just start with basic layers. Um, this is not, you know, obviously when we start getting into other kind of layer types, you can start with the basics, just learn how they work. Do a hundred percent read the docs on every layer that you're going to use. If you do not know what you're doing, uh, like you should have, looked at them before you even try to put data in because I, I well, I, I just don't know why you wouldn't. It, it tells you exactly how to use them. It's examples. Um, for some reason, some students like to ask us rather than looking it up and reading the docs. And I I think that it, it takes more of their time to ask us and wait for us to respond than it does just looking up PyTorch linear layer. So yeah, I don't know, it's up to you. Um, and then this is the thing I was talking about before, create a random tensor and pass it through the model and see if the shapes are right. Like it's the simplest thing and it will change your life. <laughs> it, that, that saved me from the first homework to the fourth homework, like, oh, like, you know, tens of hours. It was awesome. Um, yeah. And then you can also start with the example criterion and optimizer. If we give you an architecture or something, you can start with those. Uh, I would... I didn't really stray away from the criterion so much. The optimizers I played with sometimes, um, but the criterions obviously are usually based on the metric that we're actually trying to maximize for the Kaggle. So I'd suggest just sticking with those criterions. The optimizers, various ones, certain ones are better for certain problems. Um, that's something that you might have to read about. Um, for, I think all, most of them should be fine for uh, the first homework. Um, yeah, this is just reiterating, keep your model small. And there are some tips on training on Piazza that you can check out. So hyperparameter tuning. Um, now that you have a working model and it's running, you can start to try to improve things. 
um, and not just improve your model architecture, but also try to improve, you know, like, well, I guess improve your model architecture, like improve the number of layers, types of layers, the order of those layers, you know, each layer width, uh, the context size, uh, which we talked about. More, so not, uh, more context isn't always better. You know, like a hundred, like, Tense, if I say a word now and 10 seconds later, you listen to that word, doesn't really tell you what I said 10 seconds earlier. So um, different batch sizes, little, little fun fact on batch sizes. Um, the larger they are generally, the faster they go, but that's not always the case. And there's actually a really simple case in which that's not the case. Um, one of them is if you have variable length inputs that you're trying to put in, in this case, we have all constant length inputs. Although we have variable length utterances, we're not passing utterances in as our inputs. Our inputs are individual timestamps with context on either side. So those are always the same size. But if you have variable length inputs, say like some sort of time series data or, or like these utterances, if your batch size is really large and let's say that, uh, here, let me see if I can draw. What could happen is if your batch size is really large, you're, you have various size, oh geez, that's bad. You have various sized length of utterances, right? And um, there's, there's a lot of empty space if you were to make this into a single square or not square, rectangular uh, tensor, you have this empty space here. If you make the batch size really big, this empty space is more likely to be more of the room in that, in that, uh, um, in that rectangular make that rectangular tensor that you have. So what could happen is you have a bunch of little guys, one really long guy, and then something like this. And then you'll do this. I'm going to make this one input in my batch. And then look at all this empty space. This for something like a recurrent neural network, it will run over it might, if you, depending on how you do it, it will run over all this empty space and it'll waste lots of time. So there are, there are cases in which batch size being bigger, is not better. Also things like if you fill up your GPU or something, but I don't think you'll run into that. Um, hopefully not. Uh, but yeah, there are reasons why batch size bigger isn't always better. So uh, just experiment with different batch sizes before you, you know, you settle on one. And I, and one of the other TAs actually told me, he was like, you know, if, if students spent the, the 10 minutes that it took to experiment with various batch sizes, it would save you hours in the long run. So um, you can find out how long it takes. Something else I've heard is that, uh, and I believe you cover this in lecture, um, so I, I sh should have heard it because I listened to that lecture, um, is that batch size can also affect performance depending on what kind of descent you're doing. Um, so I don't think it's the biggest thing to tune in terms of uh, uh, performance for this homework especially, so don't worry about it. But um, mainly for time is the thing that you want to pay attention to, at least for the first homework. The number of epics that you need to do, that's a good thing to tune. Um, sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less. You can tune the criterion you're using. I tend to just stick with the one for the class, um, but in general, in the real world, when you start doing these problems, you can you can change what you're fitting, your, uh, how you're defining your cost and your loss. Um, you can change your optimizer. This is actually a big one for some of them. Some of them will converge faster. Some of them will um, will have better performance for your model. Some of them uh, do their training, like loss decrease looks different and their accuracy increase looks different because like they might converge faster or whatever. So do just know that if you try one it, and you do another one, it won't look the same. So all because you start out with, you know, it might say worse accuracy, but suddenly it spikes up. Like it, it will look different. So just try it. Um, for a couple of epics before you decide it doesn't work. Um, you can tune your learning rate. That's your step size. Uh, yeah. And also the momentum values within the optimizer, you, um, many of them you can define the momentum and you can uh, play around with different momentum values. There's other things as well within those and you should look up the docs to find out what they all are. Um, if you message a TA saying, hey, how can I um, best tune this, it's really hard for us because we haven't tracked all the architectures that you've done so far. And, um, and many things are specific to the architecture that you have. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's better to keep track of it yourself and try to like, it, it's just to be like, we can help you debug and we can help you tune to some extent, but it's, 
we're, we might not know the answers and often it, it's just easier to read the thing yourself. I spent some time last some, uh, the, the semester I took this class just just um, reading about these things, trying to figure it out because um, there's a lot of great, great documentation online for this. And you don't and you don't have to change all of these. You the order in which she put them here, like starting with your architecture, then going to context size and batch size, like those that order is kind of like where you can start. Uh, context size and, and layers might you might want to do at the same time. Um, play around with those, but like a bigger model generally will do better. Like in most in most cases, um, for the things that we're dealing with. But if you make it hundred layers deep, there's I don't think that that will do well. Um, it will not. It will definitely be over parameterized, meaning there are more parameters that are then are necessary to actually do the problem, which then will be more conducive to overfitting. And um, also, it might not even perform better because you have to do some special techniques to make sure that a deeper model can actually remember all the things it learned in the previous layers, which will be discussed at some point. Or you can look up how to do that. Um, yeah, you should probably change only one thing at a time or maybe two at most, um, just so that you can get experimentation. I strongly suggest for this first homework, because I understand that things are hectic at the beginning of the semester sometimes, but the homeworks will get harder. And I strongly suggest you get comfortable using at least a couple of these early on, like knowing what a different optimizer does and knowing how to tune learning rates, knowing how to use a scheduler, that stuff, like knowing how to update your layers and things like that makes uh, tune your architecture, knowing that early will help you later because you won't sit there and try to experiment later when you really just need it to run because these models will have to get bigger. So how do you keep track of all this? Um, Nora uses a spreadsheet. I have a, 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 my own sheet that I use. This is her, uh, um, her way of tracking it. It's really, it's like a really brilliant way of doing it. Uh, and it keeps track of your architectures, the number of epics you do, how well they performed. And I'd strongly suggest to do something like this. Do not try to remember it. You will try, you know, dozens of different things sometimes. And um, if you have an eidetic memory, good for you. I, I don't. So, um, yeah. This is the beware of the overfitting thing. <laughs> I think the bed meme is the best overfitting meme I've seen. Um, and it sounds like this group doesn't uh, need a review on what that is. But for anyone who might be watching this uh, replay later, that's when your model is over specific to the training data and does not generalize to actually other situations. And so the, med, the reason why I like the bad meme so much is because you can only sleep in that position, but as soon as it gets any person who sleeps in another position, it will never be able to work with them. So oh, that's perfect. Oh, and, and if you train too many epics, you, will, you might also overfit. So it's not just how big your model is and all those things. So keeping track of your loss and your accuracies is really good. Okay, so let's say you found the perfect model. Um, I, I like that meme as well. Nor these are pretty funny. Um, you found out that one of them is actually performing the best and you have this magic combination of uh, hyperparameters. What do you do at that time? Well, um, you, one thing is you really need to save them uh, because training takes time. And because of the, st the, the, the random nature in which you instantiate and descend, uh, your that descend the radiant descend, um, sorry, instantiate the weights. There's a random, you have a random instantiation of the weights and you can, you can try to affect them in some ways, but often they're randomly instantiated unless you do some special initializations. And, um, uh, and the descent itself might be randomized by you know, the training and whatever. You, it is almost impossible to get the same weights again, if you were to retrain. You can get a similar performance, but the weights won't be the same. And the performance might not be perfect, like perfectly the same either. So um, once you find a really good model, you really should save it. Um, I do, yeah, this is kind of what I do. I make the file name is equal to the trial number and the epic number, and I save it that way. You can, this is a, so she puts a torch.save model.state fix. What that's doing is there is a state dictionary that you can save. Um, I personally, I think I just do torch.save model and then file name. I don't actually do the state dict because, um, 
you can, I think you can directly save the model now in more recent versions of PyTorch. So I would, I would look up the docs on that, but I believe you can just directly save the model. Um, and the, what the state dict is, is like I said before, it's a dictionary of the state of the current model. It has all the, the layers and stuff. So if you ever print the model, it looks like a list and list of, like of, you know, dictionary objects or something. That's what that is. Um, and this, I believe the scheduler, the optimizer, all those things have their own state dict, so you can save those as well. So testing and submission. Once you have a model you like, um, you need to produce testing data. Uh, but can we use a data set that looks like the previous data set? And I'm sure you know the answer. Because we don't have labels on the test set, the answer is no, unless you put some special you know, functionality for your other data set that you can pass it. Hey, I'm a test set now. Don't you don't I don't have labels. Um, so we got to make it a different version without labels. Uh, that's what this is saying. Um, you so where is it? Where is the thing? OK, so she she highlights here. Don't shuffle. I love that. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, you you. I think inevitably at, at least once every student or most students will run into this and say, why didn't I, why isn't it performing well? First thing you do please is check if, if test loader args is on shuffle. Uh, okay, this is the loading the model part. So uh, I think in some version, later versions of PyTorch, you might not need to instant, she, she instantiates the model here. I don't think you need to do that anymore, but but please try it before you, you know, you can just try it. it, it and if it works, it works. If, if it doesn't, you, you'll just throw you an error and then I'll, it can be like, hey, you were wrong. And I'll be like, okay, my bad. Um, the other thing is, I if you don't save it as a state dict, I think you can just do torch.load. You don't need to do model.load state dict here, but that's just a small detail. Basically, the gist of the, the whole thing is save your model and then load it because it will save you. Um, this is a loop through the test set. Um, you Again, you set it to model.eval, um, and then uh, you you have to pass it to device so that you can take advantage of the GPU. One more thing that I'm, I might have forgotten to mention is that model also needs to be passed to the GPU, because it itself is a bunch of matrices that need to be passed to the GPU. So earlier, I don't know if it was shown, but um, when you instant, when you initialize the model, you should also pass it to the GPU by using two device. Um, down here, a little a little uh, detail is when you append it to this list P here, which is the predicted list. Um, you need to pass. You need to put it back to CPU, um, and I think she puts it as a NumPy object just to make it more um, compatible with the steps later that she does, but. The CPU, uh, it, it just puts it in a place where you can actually interact with it because you can't take, because hardware wise, if it's on the GPU, it's not gonna be talking very well to things that are on the CPU. So if you have a list on the CPU, you can't really put that matrix on in that list because it's not in that location. So I would suggest, you know, yeah, this is the fix is putting it on the CPU. It will tell you when your things are in the wrong place. So use those, just pay attention to those errors. Um, yep, keep track of the predictions, make sure we have them all in place. Um, there's no loss or accuracy to compute, obviously, because there are no labels. And then now creating the submission file. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that it's in the correct format and the header is, is right for the CSV writing. Um, you're going to make it into a list of the, the outputs. Um, She's doing a very specific way of doing this. I literally made a string and then wrote to a CSV file using the right line functionality. I think you import CSV and you do something like that. My way is not as clean and beautiful as this. So I think this is pretty cool. But if you basically create a dictionary of the results in the right order with the IDs from zero to N, you have the predictions. Um, look at the sample CSV if you're wondering what the format looks like and do it like that. You can then convert the dictionary to a pandas data frame from a NumPy array. And then you can do this awesome thing where you just cast it to a data frame and then write it to a CSV all in those three lines there. And I think that's super cool because my write, my write CSV was longer and this is super short. 
And then finally, you can go to Kaggle. You can literally download your CSV and submit it, or you can do it via the, um, the command line. And then congratulations, you will have made your first submission or hopefully one of your many later. So, um, and if your accuracy is good enough, you can, you know, you'll make some grade cutoff and, uh, and you will, you will, you'll be happy. I believe that the B cutoff should be pretty, um, not, not too uh, inaccessible for people. I, the A cutoff might be a little harder. Well, it should be obvious. Alrighty, I think. Oh, that's cute. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, she did it at night, so they had to stay up. I believe after this is just a meme reservoir um, for when people are sick of debugging, if you want to look at this. Um, but for now, why don't I, does anyone in here have questions? No, thank you. It was pretty, pretty, pretty clear. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Well, that's all from me. So I'm going to stop the recording.